Um, and, uh, you know, what I, you know, more than anything else, what I'm doing is just sharing some thoughts on uh, Afghanistan uh, from a, a federal law enforcement practitioner's mindset, if you will. Uh, I want to warn everybody, I'm not uh, from academia, and I'm not a lawyer, all right? Uh, I spent... Uh, <laughs> Ben, how did you feel about that? Um, so listen, um, if you if you look at pre-U.S. occupation in Afghanistan, uh, you, look, the Taliban was involved in the drug trade. In that, it was taxing farmers, it was taxing uh, drugs as they would uh, cross the Afghan border into other uh, other surrounding countries. They were taxing precursor chemicals as they were coming in. They were making a lot of money behind that, uh, behind all of that activity. If you flash forward to today, uh, they're involved in every aspect of the trade. Um, uh, they uh, very much followed in the footpath or footpath of the uh, of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. Uh, as they got deeper and deeper over the years, their involvement uh, in the trade. Uh, it started with uh, the taxing of farmers, as I said. They then began forming some alliances with some of the traditional, for lack of a better term, cartels, organized crime, whatever you want to call them, uh, to provide security at uh, their, their um, uh, cache sites, their laboratories, uh, and uh, again, border crossings, those kinds of areas. And the deeper they got, the more they realized how much more, more money that they could make and uh, today they, as I said, they're involved in even the production of, of, uh, of heroin because the security that they were providing at laboratories uh, caused them to realize, just like the, the FARC realized um, 20 plus years ago, it, you, know, you don't need a degree from MIT uh, to refine poppy into, uh, uh, into opium, opium into morphine, morphine in, into heroin. Um, uh, it, it's as difficult as it was uh, for the DEA, um, uh, and I was talking to George about this just to, uh, you know, before we kicked this off, uh, DEA actually is the only U.S. federal law enforcement agency that lost personnel in Afghanistan. They lost uh, three specially trained and equipped uh, agents uh, that were on a counter-narcotics -narc operation supported by Task Force 160. U.S. Army Special Operations Forces, uh, as well as Marine Corps Special Operations Forces. And after a heated uh, firefight at a lab complex uh, as they were withdrawing from the area, after a success, uh, the helicopter unfortunately um, experienced uh, some problems and went down. And there were three DE agents that were killed on that aircraft, literally sitting side by side after fighting shoulder to shoulder uh, with U.S. military uh, personnel. And DEA has had several other uh, agents that have been wounded um, uh, as a result of operations in Afghanistan. The point being is that, as I said, uh, the Taliban is now, has now evolved into what I would refer to as a full-blown hybrid terrorist organization. They are a designated terrorist organization, but they're also uh, a very powerful emerging uh, organized crime um, organized crime group, transnational criminal organization, if you will. And then when you consider that 90 percent of all the heroin consumed in the world is coming out of Afghanistan, uh, it paints a pretty troubling picture. But even more troubling is, is this, um, is that as our conventional forces withdraw from, uh, from Afghanistan, uh, especially if we end up going with a zero option, uh, the agents uh, from DEA that will be remaining in country, um, quite frankly, will be confined to operations inside the wire because they don't have the supporting arms, uh, they don't have um, the firepower uh, that special operations forces or conventional forces can bring to bear. Uh, what they do have is the mindset that our military doesn't have, nor do they, nor do they want it, and that is attacking very powerful transnational criminal organizations. That's what DEA brings to the fight, and some of them have been specially trained and equipped, as I said, by U.S. Navy SEALs, by 
uh, by Whitesoft and by, uh, by MARSOC forces. They undergo rigorous, rigorous training and in a, in a, probably an even more rigorous selection process. Um, but they simply, you know, 50 or 60 of these guys in Afghanistan simply aren't, aren't, going, to, uh, aren't going to get the job done. And that's what, uh, that's what really troubles me. <clears throat> as I, when I was at DEA as the Chief of Operations, when the counterinsurgency, the new coin uh, strategy and doctrine, if you will, was published, George, I think, what, 2007 or uh, 2006 or 2007, autographed by General Petraeus, uh, there was this sudden um, uh, desire uh, by many uh, four-star, three-star, and other flag-ranked officers to learn more about the convergence of drugs and terror. And there was one study that I always left them with uh, that, uh, that I think um, um, I'll use to kind of sum up what I'm, what I'm saying. It was, a, it was a study that was conducted by Stanford University, a professor by the name of James Farron. And he and I'm sure his loyal band of graduate students identified 128 insurgencies and in civil war or civil wars that played out from the end of 1945 the end of World War II uh, to the two th to the year 2000 and uh, the report was published I believe in or the study was published in uh, it was either 2001 or two and someone told me recently it may have even been updated <clears throat> and I don't want to look I don't want to oversimplify this and I and I don't want to make it too general, but I, I, I just don't have enough time. Um, you can find it on the internet. Um, but what it did was, that, you know, they identified 128 conflicts, insurgencies and civil wars that played out during that period of time, from 45 to, to 2000. <clears throat> on average, they lasted eight years, eight to eight and a half years. But what they also found was there were 17 that lasted on average five times longer than the other 111. And the only common thread that those 17 had were those insurgent and terrorist groups were generating their own contraband revenue. Uh, and this, you know, the case study, honestly, that, that you know, the, the real case study to that, to that um, research is the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Columbia. Um, they're 50 years old this year. Um, when their state sponsorship from um, indirect state sponsorship from Russia dried up when the so or excuse me from the Soviet Union when they came apart at the seams in 1991 and the old funding stream from the Soviet Union into Cuba downward to groups like the FARC, Sendero Luminoso, the M M19, ELN and others when it dried up almost overnight the FARC that had been previously diabolically opposed to being involved in any aspect of the, globe, of the global drug trade, okay, reached a unanimous decision amongst their executive secretariat very quickly. We know this, okay? Uh, we had inside information. Within five minutes, they voted unanimously. If we're going to survive, if we're going to keep the movement alive, we have got to get involved in the cocaine trade. And they were and are and remain at the center of gravity for that global illicit uh, trade in that, that, that market. If you move forward to today, in 21, 22 years, they've gone from a, a terrorist organization. It's been designated, by, by the way, by our country as well as the European unit, union, uh, union as a foreign terrorist organization. They went from no involvement in the drug trade to they are today the single largest uh, distribution, manufacturing and distribution uh, cartel, if you will, uh, for cocaine in the world. Lastly, the DEA um, conducted a, a study a few years ago, I believe it was at the request of the NSC, to do a comparative analysis of the FARC and the Taliban. Were there any similarities? I wasn't shocked to find out that the Taliban was following on the exact same path uh, that the FARC took, took many years ago. You know, when you consider that, and when you consider that study by, by, um, uh, by Professor Farron at Stanford University, 
What I always left the four stars and three stars was with, with this. As long as you're fighting an inter terrorist group or an insurgent group that's generating their own contraband revenue, if you're not also doing something about that contraband revenue, you're in for a one hell of a long fight. And that's what I'm afraid of. This fight's going to continue. What really scares me is that if we go with a zero option, I'm afraid the Taliban is going to, to evolve into a group that is far more dangerous than they ever were before we invaded the place in uh, 2002. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Admiral Lyons, I'll give you the first question, then I've got a question of my own as well. Yeah, so the question is, is what's the Iranian involvement? And that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> it's very unclear, just like most of everything else that, you know, uh, uh, what we do or what we don't know about Iran. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's very unclear. What I can tell you, Admiral, is that in one... Uh, if you look at this thing from kind of one angle, Iran is suffering uh, from one of the, the, you know, the world's largest heroin uh, and opium uh, addiction uh, problems in the world. Per capita population, yeah, they, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually with you on that one too. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's one dimension of this thing. But then you, you know, there's ample evidence that the IG, IRGC Quds Force is facilitating a great deal of the movement of, of heroin, and they're being paid large amounts of money uh, for uh, their involvement in moving large loads of heroin uh, through Iran to other, uh, other parts of the world. The one thing that I did mention is, you know, the one good piece to this whole Afghanistan story is that only somewhere between only between six to eight percent of the heroin that's being abused in the United States is coming from Afghanistan. The vast majority of the heroin that, that's being abused in our country comes from Mexico and South America, particularly Colombia. Um, with that said, there are in, there's a trend that worries me in that uh, we're seeing more and more Afghan heroin in Canada. We all know where that's at geographically, and that that concerns me. Um, Mike, just a quick question. Before we kicked this off, we were talking a little bit about <clears throat> how folks at the center are uh, interested in things like unmanned systems. And I was wondering if you had any insight or could talk at all about the role that unmanned systems, unmanned aerial vehicles, or, or drones as some call them, has played in this particular part of, the, uh, of our presence of in Afghanistan. How, to what extent have those kinds of platforms been helpful in dealing with sort of the narco dimension of, of our presence there? Yeah. Well, I, another good question. They, they've played an extremely important um, role. And thanks to the Department of Defense, um, DOD made uh, those assets available uh, to DEA uh, in Afghanistan to support their investigations and their operations. And, and you know, and that's another important piece to this thing. When, you know, when DEA is engaged in an operation in Afghanistan, it is, you know, it's very, it's very much judicially focused. You know, the idea is, is, you know, they're after evidence that can be collected as a result of the operation uh, that will ultimately uh, bring uh, the highest level traffickers in the region uh, to justice. And, and uh, that's an important, I think, aspect or dimension of DEA that's oftentimes overlooked. A um, couple of examples, uh, the agency brought to, brought to justice a um, uh, couple, of, couple of guys, Haji Bashir Norzai in 2004, uh, and um, who was on the top ten parade uh, and was being heavily sought uh, by, uh, by U.S. Special Operations Forces in Afghanistan um, because he was a founding, one of the five founding uh, fathers of the Taliban ruling Shura in Kabul, but he was also the world's largest, most notorious heroin trafficker. He's now sitting in a prison for 30 years in the United States. Uh, the guy that took his place was a guy by the name of Haji Bajko, 
another one of the five founding fathers of the Taliban ruling Shura in Kabul, uh, but also uh, Norzai's right-hand guy. So is there a connection between drugs and terror? Duh. Yeah, there is. Um, uh, and, and the judicial, um, you know, the, the judicial approach is not the right tool in a wartime situation in a declared area of war or an undeclared area of war. It's not always the right tool, okay? We need to kill as many of these bastards as we can as far as I'm concerned, all right? But when you bring someone at that level to justice, followed by Haji Juma Khan and a laundry list of others, when you bring them to justice, that is an important message to send uh, to people in Afghanistan, the region, and really around the world, that the rule of law can be extraordinarily effective, and what the COCOMs, uh, especially those outside of declared area, areas of war without an executive order, short of that, they can't just go, you know, kill people like I wish we could do sometimes, uh, but it becomes a very powerful uh, implement of power, a very powerful strategic tool, potential st strategic tool in their, in their toolbox. And fortunately, with the help of Congress and the extraterritorial jurisdictions, the very powerful jurisdictions uh, that DEA's got, if you can, you know, if they can get their hands on one of these, these knuckleheads and they can get them back to the U.S., they're going to convict them and they're going to lock them up for the rest of their lives and, uh, and they're off the battlefield. Other questions? Yes, Marshall. <clears throat> One tactic is herbicides, and the argument always against it is it'll hurt the poor farmer sure. or uh, contaminate the end product, which would be harvested as soon as you used them. Uh, but still, if you eliminate the crop, eventually you're going to eliminate the product. Yeah. Your first name again, I'm sorry. Paul? No, Marshall from uh, Mar the Reserve Officers Association. Okay, Marshall. Great, great question. Um, so here's what I can tell you. Um, I've never seen a successful counter-narcotics strategy anywhere in the world in a production country, a country that's producing drugs, that doesn't have three things. Um, you've got to have education, prevent, prevention, treatment. I'll roll that up into to one. The second thing that you absolutely have to have is you've got to have enforcement, okay? The, you know, the tier one leaders of these very powerful organizations have to be investigated. You've got to bring them to justice, or if they choose to fight, they die, whatever, okay? But you need to, you need to, I do too, Admiral. Um, you know, you, you take them out of, the, out of the fight, all right? That's the, that's the second thing, um, enforcement. The third pillar that you absolutely have to have is eradication. We have never had an had an effective eradication program in Afghanistan. We don't have an eradication program, an effective eradication program in Afghanistan today. That's the Department of State's job. I'm not, you know, that's a tough job. It's one that fortunately DEA has never been responsible for and hopefully never will be responsible for. Uh, but it's, you know, that, that's, that's a tough job. Now, if I could take this one step further, though, is, you know, there's been very little in 70 plus years that hasn't been tried when it comes to counter narcotics, okay? Um, and George, you remember this stuff from, you know, uh, back in the day in Peru and Bolivia and Colombia and everywhere else. Uh, a good friend of mine, a three star, called, um, gosh, I was in, the, I'd probably been out in the private sector for about two years, called one day and he said, hey, Mike, look, he says, we're, we're, we're you know, Somebody came up with, a, with what I believe is a really great idea in Afghanistan. Why don't, you know, and we're kicking it around here. It's beginning to pick, pick up some, uh, some steam. And he said, what if we just buy all the poppy crops? What if we just buy it all? Okay, wouldn't that, you know, what do you think about that? I said, well, it's been tried several places, and it's failed. It's been an abject failure, and here's why. Because all of those farmers that you've been working hard to grow legitimate crops, if you're going to pay 10 times more for an illegitimate crop, guess where they're, guess what they're going to be planting next, next week, okay? So I said that's part of the problem. Now, one guy's, okay, I don't think anyone's ever done this, 
I, I, you know, I don't have patent rights to this or anything like that. I just hope somebody runs with it someday. I said, why don't, why don't, if you're going to do something, why don't you talk about this? And I didn't, I should have prefaced it with it. A, a, a farmer in Afghanistan gets paid. He, he's going to make ten times more for growing poppy than he's going to make for avocados, cashews, uh, you name it. I don't care what it is, all right? So I said, why don't, why don't we think about this, okay? It, you know, it's going to take us a minimum of ten years, which is unthinkable, but we need like a ten-year strategy here, all right? Let's pay farmers ten times more for their legitimate crops. Whatever the poppy crop is going for, let's pay farmers the same amount of money for a legitimate crop, okay? During that 10 or 15 year period, we get serious about building farm to market roadway systems and those kinds of things to help them grow into this new way of doing business, all right? And then over time, we begin to wean them from those high payments, and we get it down to a realistic level, all right? Uh, we have somewhat of a similar approach right here in the United States, okay? Um, but, but, you know, why don't we think about doing that, okay? Because, you'll, you know, it, that could become a, an extraordinarily important piece to a counter, counterinsurgency strategy, I believe, by the way. Um, that, that just really opens the doors to building lasting relationships uh, with the populace and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, but anyway. So we have time for one more short question and short answer. Dan. If you could use the mic, please. Yeah. How much difference is there really between the, the bad guys operating freely, which would result from a zero presence, and our best efforts? It sounds like while we had military superiority in Afghanistan, we weren't able to really make a dent in this problem. And now we're going to be entering a new era. Just the example you just gave, yeah. we're not going to be able to enforce a buy program when we're not on the ground. Yeah. And the Taliban is there threatening to shoot them if they don't grow their poppies for them. So yeah. how, how much difference is there really going to be between the best effort we can expect with a reasonable presence on the ground and the zero option. I mean, I know there's other reasons not to do the zero option, but... I, I, your first name, I'm sorry. I'm Dan Pollock. Dan, okay. Good question. I, I, I don't have an answer for you. I, I can tell you some of what I believe we did wrong, okay? But I, but I understand it. Um, when we in, invaded Afghanistan, one guy's opinion, and look, I'm not a military, you know, expert, uh, far from it. Um, uh, <clears throat> but our, our military um, wanted no part of any, it wanted nothing to do with counter-narcotics in Afghanistan uh, probably for the first five to six years that our military had a presence in, in country, okay? Um, but they didn't have the levels of troops uh, nor equipment uh, that Iraq had, as an example. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, I don't think that they had the, uh, the power uh, to, to, to really, you know, fight terrorists and insurgents and at the same time even support DEA um, and others. Uh, uh, you know, British counter-narcotics forces were, or, or counter-narcotics police were in Afghanistan. The Australians, are, they're, you know, others also. Uh, and uh, some folks from ICE were, were assigned over there. The FBI had a presence. Um, but they were, simply were not in a, in a position to, to support U.S. Law, law enforcement. Now, as we began building up, the presence in Afghanistan is, I believe, about the time we began to see, see a change. Uh, but I also attribute some of that uh, to to honestly, candidly, to, to DEA, um, high-level policy-making, flag-ranked officers reaching out to DEA to learn more about the convergence of drugs and terror. And as they began to understand this threat more clearly, and as more studies were coming out of academia, like Professor Farron's study, um, without a doubt, they realized the importance of, okay, you can't fight one without at least, you know, as much 
vigor and effort focused on the other one, are you going to be in for a long fight? So, you know, I, I, I don't know if that helps, helps you or not. So, Dan, so.